<laughs> so, my wife and I were driving back from uh, Austin uh, last yesterday. We had a great weekend with the uh, Good Friday off. We drove down to uh, uh, Fredericksburg to the uh, KOA campgrounds out there. And uh, we've been there many, many times. It's one of those favorite family stopping places. We've been down there often because it's so close to where our kids are going to college. And we met up with uh, James and Hannah and uh, the girlfriend, the new girlfriend. So <laughs> she, uh, she's sweet, Abigail. Uh, and she joined us and brought her friend, uh, another Hannah. So we had two Hannahs. And uh, uh, unfortunately, my, my Hannah's boyfriend wasn't able to join us. So we would have had a whole big college little group. And uh, we had a great time. Uh, German food, it was wonderful. But driving back yesterday, we, are, uh, we, we, we all broke off. And kids are going back to their, finish their semesters now. <clears throat> we are pulling the pop-up camper. This pop-up camper, you know, uh, these things are designed to be, you know, reliable, except for the occasional tire blow, which has happened to us. But that's easy. You just pull over and jack it up and change the tire. I've done that many, many times in the hot Texas summer. Those tires just have a tendency to get really worn out pretty quick. So you got to keep those things fresh. If you ever get into a pop-up camper, just remember that. However, what happened yesterday has never happened before. We were, uh, now here's the setup, and we're driving down, and I'm, my, Ellen's asleep, she's taking a nap, and I'm, all of a sudden I hear the sound, and I'm thinking, oh no, you know, I just had those things, those things aren't even a year old, those tires, you know, you get these things, they're about 80 bucks a piece, and uh, there's smoke billowing out of the back of the pop-up camper, just blowing, and then I noticed that the Toyota van that was behind us swerves because he sees the smoke and he's like changing lanes quick and I'm thinking life flashes before my eyes you know what's going on I'm not going to get out of this one so I slowly make my lane change and the smoke's getting worse and worse and I'm I get off and there's an exit right there thankfully I was like oh great there's an exit so I I said I tell Ellen <clears throat> all right we're getting off this exit I'm just going to have to change the tire so we get off the exit, and then, the, then there's this uh, right there on the right, the first parking lot, we pull in, okay? And I pull in the pop-up camper, and there's still smoke billowing out. I'm thinking, internal fire? Flame? What's going on? I don't see any fire, and I'm a little hesitant to get near it, and I'm looking at and the things kind of leaning a little bit, and I look, oh, my, and I notice that the leaf, the, the spring, has broken. Spring is broken on a pop-up camper. I didn't think that ever happened. Those things, I mean, I mean it must be a fluke. But yeah, the, the leaf spring, uh, pop-up campers don't have a, um air shock. They have just the spring. So it's a metal spring that kind of causes the bounce when you go over a, a bump. And you see pop-up campers on the road. Have you ever seen them bouncing along? Thankfully, that's what the springs do. So it's a spring, and it caused, and it broke. So the tire is literally... The, the tread of the tire is being ripped off of the tire by the metal frame of the pop-up camper. And all of this smoke is basically billowed out through the pop-up camper. So I have to take the top you know, off and lift it up so it airs out a little bit. And we look around, and you know, there's, there's, there's RVs parked along the front. And uh, one guy comes out, and he says, oh, well, you know, uh, what we're doing is uh, we're all parked here because in the morning we're having our RV service. This is an RV service center. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right. So uh, I'm thinking this might be my lucky day, you know. <laughs> and um, so I get out my – actually, it's this marker right here. It was in my – my this thing I took with me, this mail purse or whatever you call it. <laughs> and I had this, and I wrote it on a, on a, on a piece of paper, and I – duct taped it, uh, gorilla taped it to my pop-up camper. I said, here's my number. I'll call you in the morning, and we'll get this thing figured out. So I just left the camper there. And, and um, so here's how it all worked out. So yeah, you, you know, RV repair center, right? Yeah, first facility building you know, business right there on the right, right at the exit where our spring blew. 
so I, I before class this morning, I noticed I, I did a quick Google search and I wanted to get their number so I could call them at least after class. But I noticed they were open at six, and I was here really early this morning, so I called. And so this gal answers the phone. She sounds nice, and I'm talking to her. I'm hoping that she's not like mad or something, or it's already called the tow truck to have this thing removed, you know. And I'm talking to her, and it ends up. She said, oh, yeah, we were just talking about it already this morning. I talked to the boys, and they thought that they could probably fix it right here in our facility. Oh. It's like, oh, yeah, they can do all kinds of things. We fix RVs. We fix, you know, I was like, we'll take care of it. I said, well, I'll drive down. It's okay. And then she said, you know, and then I said, well, it's just so cool. You have made my day. You've been such a blessing. I think, you know, this must be a God thing. I said that to her, and she said, are you a Christian? I said, yeah. <laughs> she said, I am too. Uh, my husband and I were driving back last night, and the same thing happened to us. We were driving our IV, RV, and we had a, a blowout. And we, she said, and right there at the exit, we pulled off, and there was an RV repair place. <laughs> and they fixed the, our tire You know, within an hour. We were back on the road. Mm. It's like, man, isn't that interesting? You know? I said, we, so we had a little... Hallelujah moment, just on the phone at 6.30 in the morning. It was like, you have made my day. So all that to say, I, it just reminded me, you know, by the way, he is risen, right? right. Yeah. And we celebrated that yesterday, and it was like, this all kind of came together for me. It just reminded me, and actually I was thinking about this after the service we went to. We went to the my son's church down there in Austin, Austin Stone Church in had a powerful Easter message, of course, as I'm sure your churches did as well. But it reminded me of how, you know, seamlessly this all fits together and weaves through the narrative that we've been, you know, a lot of you had me last semester, and you, again this semester, you've heard me repeat this big idea, the, the bookends of the Old Testament. We started with Genesis 3. We, we looked at the problem, and the Lord God said to the serpent, you know, because you've done this, cursed are you more than all the cattle. That's Genesis 3.14. And more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go. And dust you shall eat all the days of your life. And this is the key verse. And I'll put enmity between you and the woman and between her seed, your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. He shall bruise you on the head. I thought about the passage, um, uh, the passage that was used in the sermon yesterday. I think uh, First Peter. Let's turn to First Peter. And uh, I hope I get this right. Yeah, they were using the text from 1 Peter. 1 Peter 1, verse 20. <clears throat> For he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but has appeared in these last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. And then this idea is just uh, really struck me that we, we are believers in God. We are, we are participating in the, uh, the, the implications of Genesis 3.15. Have you ever thought of that before? In a little bite-sized chunks, <laughs> we, through the extension of our individual ministries and our corporate ministries, we're bruising the, the, the heel. We're bruising the... The, according to this verse, the head of the serpent. We are, through our individual ministries and corporate ministries, we are literally involved in the corporate butt-kicking of the devil. <laughs> Have you ever thought of that? It just struck me. And So these little, these little hallelujah moments that we have just seem to be glimpses of the reality that you know, Paul writes in Romans 8, we've looked at that passage before, and we talked about the suffering, the impact of suffering as it relates to glory. 
and it seems that Paul, as, as well as other uh, Old and New Testament authors, talk about the fact that we're participating in the suffering of Christ, and through that we are going to produce a glory that <coughs> outweighs everything and pales in comparison and all the, the different ways that's described. So through these difficult times and through these tire blowout moments, we have the adversity that comes, but because of our witness and because of our faith and trust, and oh, how am I going to get through this? It's just one more thing. It's one more expense. It's one more whatever. And we find that there's just glimpses of, oh, God says, I got this. Don't worry. I let you suffer for a little bit. It was a little tough. It was a little hard. I got your back. You know, and then we move through it, and we come out on the end, and we've We've had one more opportunity to turn it around and kick somebody else's butt who deserves it more, you know, that we do. The eternal butt kicking that's going to happen. And it just seems that uh, this passage in uh, 1 Peter lines well up with uh, what Paul talks about. There's, and I, I think I talked about it when we were focusing on Job. There seems to be this mysterious, timeless aspect of the one who suffered. So it starts with, you know, the idea of there's this he, and we're waiting for him to be revealed. Who will this one be, you know? And we've seen how scripture continues to unpack this, and authors start to pick this up and say, let me give a little more paint here. Let me fill this in with a little more splash of color. And then the prophets start to, we'll talk about this more in the fall, but the prophets start to sing this hallelujah chorus with regards to, Oh, yeah, well, he's going to be the one who suffers, the suffering servant of Isaiah. And then we start to have the day of the Lord, you know, talk about the turning up the volume knob. So all of these things start to focus on, yeah, he's going to be born in Bethlehem. Yeah, he's going to be coming as a king. Um, yeah, he's coming once, but he's going to come again, you know, all of these things. So from our vantage point, we're still looking ahead to, the, thankfully, the unraveling of this story is, fact that we have all of this to look forward to. And uh, I think that there'll be one day when we don't have to have a worry about anymore about tire blowouts on our pop-up campers. Hopefully we'll still be going camping in the, the new heaven, new earth, I think. I don't think we'll all be floating around with angels' wings and playing harps. That's not the picture I think that we have of the, of the new creation, but it'll be a renewed creation. <clears throat> and one we'll be able to enjoy, though, without the sting of the futility of life. I think that'll be gone. The sting of death and some of those things. So so ultimately, we have the one who's coming. The he has been announced. And I think we've been invited to participate in this ongoing ministry. And our little victories along the way, I think, are continual reminders to the one who's roaring around like a lion. He sees us, and like Job, he sees how we respond. <coughs> And he just continues to have his head bruised. <laughs> I'll say it that way. The head bruising. So we're participating in that. And uh, I think we're invited. Because we're participating in that, a little bit of that means that we're going to suffer along the way. But we're suffering with the one who suffered. We're suffering with Christ. That's what Paul says. And then because of that, God is pleased. And there's a mysterious glory that's produced. Otherwise wouldn't have been produced, I don't think. And there's a greater glory that comes because of our suffering. So I just wanted to shout that out to you all today and uh, share that as a little glimpse of life. I'm sure you can come up with your own, <laughs> your own accounts. Uh, I want to pray for uh, one of the students who, who had some life cave in on her this last few weeks with a lot of things going on. I won't give you all the details, but I want to pray for Leanne. And uh, she's one of our online students and uh, asked for some prayer and some grace with regards to having to fall behind but getting caught up again before the semester's in. So we, we, we talked about that. And uh, so let's pray for her and I'll just uh, lead us in prayer and we'll get started. Gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the uh, little glimpses that we see occasionally of your great hand at work. And Lord, even as we look at and finish the book of Esther, we'll see that you were very active behind the scenes, um, though quietly, and um, 
in a book that doesn't even call you by name will see that you were working and protecting and opening the doors for your people, uh, working through the faithfulness and fidelity of those working behind the scenes and in uh, difficult circumstances. Lord, that's our story as well. Lord, many of us are serving uh, in ministries. Uh, we might feel a little bit isolated in countries where we are serving around the world where uh, things are not so favorable to uh, Christians and those who, who trust in you. Lord, but we press on and we know that, Lord, as Paul and so many of the authors of the Old Testament and New Testament remind us that we're suffering with the one who suffered and one who suffered from eternity past and into eternity future and on behalf of our sins, Lord, as we were reminded yesterday. And we thank you for that and your grace and your mercy that you extend to us and you invite us into ministries and we are essentially participating with you in defeating the uh, enemy uh, and we know that he'll have his ultimate uh, destruction and justice will be rendered. And Lord, we're on your side and we thank you for that. Lord, we pray for... Uh, um, Leanne, particularly in her situation, and Lord, we pray for the healing with those who she mentioned who are suffering from uh, illness and for those emergency situations. We just pray that you would just give her and grant her great strength and allow her to uh, rebuild and reconnect and um, get back into and find the new normal in her situation. For all the details that I just pray you know them, and I just pray that you'd work out each one. Uh, to your grace and your glory. Lord, for others and unspokens, we pray, Lord, as we approach the end of this semester, I pray for these students that in this and other classes as well, you grant them um, multiplication of energy and time as they prepare for the final papers and, and exams. <coughs> but Lord, remind them that as they prepare, it's in the preparation that you would be glorified. And Lord, that this, their ministries would be enhanced and changed forever. Lord, in little ways along the way. Lord, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> All right. We're going to finish up the book of uh, Esther. And uh, we'll pick up uh, the slide sets in uh, Blackboard in week folder 13. In case you need that, you want to look and see what we're talking about here and supplement your notes that way. We're to, I think, the high point in the book of Esther. And, here we go, wrong direction. <clears throat> All right. In chapter 4, verse 1, well, you know, setting up the book of Esther we talked about last week. Esther's a lot like a Joseph or a Daniel um, and we meet up with Mordecai. We met up with Mordecai. So these are these are people and, and faithful Jews who are positioned. Um, Did share the... hmm? Did share the... I didn't. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Yes. All right, let me pick that up. Yeah. Uh, pause. Oh, I didn't. Yeah, let me do a screen share. <clears throat> How's that? Better? Okay, sorry about that. Pretty good with technology. All right. All right. <laughs> All right, let's turn to uh, chapter four. Let's look at the first uh, four verses here. So I was saying, you know, Mordecai is stepping in at, at a just the right time. He is representative of a Daniel or like a Joseph working behind the scenes, working in foreign territory, foreign turf, under foreign rulers. And these are faithful Jews whom God allows to rise to uh, positions of influence. And in cases like this, as we'll see very strategically at just the right time in salvation history, it seems. So verse 1, when Mordecai learned all that had been done, he tore his clothes, put on sackcloth and ashes, and went out into the midst of the city and wailed loudly and bitterly. Of course, what is he? What is he? 
hearing about, right? <clears throat> what, is, what has just happened? Do you remember? Haman's plot, right? Yeah. So this is, this is tragic. Um, and he went as far as the king's gate, for no one was to enter the king's gate clothed in sackcloth. And in each and every province where the command and decree of the king came, there was a great mourning among the Jews, with fasting, weeping, and wailing, and many lay on sackcloth and ashes. Then Esther's maidens and her eunuchs came and told her, the queen, um, writhed in great anguish, and she sent garments to clothe Mordecai, <clears throat> that he might remove his sackcloth from him, but he did not accept them. So I think what's uh, what's behind the scenes here, with the emphasis on mourning, of course the sackcloth and ashes, for faithful Jews, even though it's not mentioned here, what would have also come with that? That we've seen in other contexts. Anybody? You think prayer? I mean mourning, sackcloth and ashes. These are faithful Jews. They're not pagans. They're behind the scenes. They're part of a, a community that seems to be working. We're going to see uh, evidence of this, I think, throughout the text, even though we don't see the name of God, Elohim, or Yahweh mentioned in the text. I think we're going to see, or at least I want to make the case that these are, this is part of a faithful community behind the scenes. I think there's evidence here, for example, this, this is, you know, this kind of activity, this is mourning, they're going to recognize they have a tragedy. There's, they're, they're coming together here as a community. Um, Esther's going to hear of the edict. She's going to reply to Mordecai in verses uh, 10 through 11. Let's take a look there. <coughs> then Esther spoke to Hathak <clears throat> and ordered him to reply to Mordecai. All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that for any man or woman who comes to the king or to the inner court who is not summoned, he has but one law, that he be put to death unless the king holds out to him the golden scepter so that he may live. And I have not been summoned to come uh, to the king for 30 days. So this is part of the... Um, part of the struggle now for, for Esther. <coughs> so sh her situation is really becomes pretty desperate. If she does nothing, what's going to happen? She'll die with all the Jews once she's discovered. Um, this is going to be, she'll be part of the, tra the national tragedy. However, if she tries to approach the king uninvited, what potentially could happen? Yeah, so she's looking at a fork in the road situation. I don't know if you've ever seen this before, but a desperate situation. If she does nothing, she's probably as good as dead. If she does something, she's as good as dead. So she's risking death. This is a death or death situation for Esther. Mordecai replies and focuses, uh, interesting, verse 14 is, a little mini theological high point for the whole book. Let's take a look at verse 14. So Mordecai tells them to rely to reply to Esther. <clears throat> Do not imagine that you in the king's palace can escape any more than all the other Jews. So he acknowledges that that fork in the road anyway for Esther. And then 14, the other fork in the road. But if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place, and you and your father's house will perish, and who knows whether you have not attained royalty for such a time as this. I'm sure you've heard this before. I think that's part of maybe the strongest subtle uh, reference there to the Lord's divine activity, and it's probably in two places there. Um, if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. In other words, I think that might be Mordecai acknowledging that the Lord is going to respond to his faithful. He's, you know, there might be another plan that we have here, Esther. It may not come from you. If you, if you choose to not act, then the Lord might go a different direction 
uh, to do something on behalf of the Jews. But it might be, Esther, that for such a time as this, you're queen and you have the opportunity to act. Even though you might put your own life in, on the line, but you're the one, you're going to have to trust in the Lord. So I'm filling in some blanks here, but I think that's the kind of conversation that they're having um, at this point. Um, and it's not the first time that we've seen faithful, um, this kind of faithfulness coming from, uh, I would say, faithful women in the biblical context. So Esther falls in line here with uh, a Ruth and a Naomi. Remember their desperate situation last fall. Uh, we talked about the book of Ruth. Hannah, of course, the mother of Samuel, um, her desperate situation, her barrenness, and you know, coming and trusting in the Lord to produce Samuel. Um, so I think this is what we have to see here, um, some subtle references to um, Mordecai and here Esther uh, acting and here responding within the faith, faithful, the faith community that's probably going on and behind the scenes, probably, no, though not mentioned in the text, prayer, and, um, you know, they're trusting in the Lord here as a, as a community. I might be filling in the blanks a little bit too much. It's speculation. It's hard to say how widespread the faithful remnant was at the time. But remember, they're part of the group that's staying back, not because they're choosing to be pagans, but because they're well-placed. You know, there was this faithful community that made the track because of Cyrus's decree who have gone already back back to Jerusalem, and that was a trip that took faith. We, we've already talked about that. So they're still probably, although they've been reduced in size, this faithful community that's, that's in operation. Well, we have a little, you know, this festival of Purim. Interestingly, March 13th, 2017, is when it was celebrated um, this last year. This is a, a feast that uh, comes from uh, the name Purim. If we go back to uh, chapter 3, verse 7, when Haman was uh, working here to determine when the day of the uh, slaughter would be, you see in the first month, which is the month of Nisan, in the twelfth year of King Ahasuerus, Pur, that's the Purim, that is the lot, was cast before Haman from day to day until they determined when this was going to be. This casting of lots idea is, is the idea behind the, the Purim or the lots, casting of lots idea. Um, and the Feast of Purim comes from basically the book of Esther. It's interesting. It's not a feast that is listed anywhere in the, the feast that we've already covered in, like, say, the book of Leviticus and and the, and the Pentateuch. It's not a Moses prescribed festival or feast. This comes from the actual event of history that took place. So uh, it's the modern Jewish holiday celebrated. And, and then still you probably find, maybe you've participated with um, or, or know of Jews who still celebrate this modern. It's like a Independence Day, our Independence Day for the Jewish uh, community um, to remember the deliverance, the Lord's deliverance from the plot of Haman. All right? So we see now back to chapter 4 and verse 16. So Esther, now it's her turn to uh, mobilize. And we see that in verse 15 and 16. Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, Go, assemble all the Jews who are found in Susa, which is where they are, and fast for me. There's another reference, I think, to prayer and fasting, even though prayer's not there. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my maidens also will fast in the same way. And thus I will go into the king, which is not according to the law. And if I perish, I perish. I think that's a statement of faith. I mean, it took some courage and recognition. Um, I think like, uh, I think this is kind of setting up a situation similar to Daniel before he goes into the lion's den. Would you all agree? This is her lion's den moment. Even though, you know, we don't have all the details. Oh, I fasted and prayed all night. 
I saw a messenger of the Lord standing next to me, or whatever. But you get to chapter 5, this is, this is her lion's den, uh, this banquet that's going on here. <clears throat> All right, so uh, what we have, let's look at chapter 5, verses 1. So what happens here? Let's have uh, Kelsey. Where are you? <coughs> There you are. Could you read, uh, beginning in chapter 5, verse 1? On the third day, Esther put on her royal robes and stood in the inner court of the king's house in front of the king's quarters, while the king was sitting on his royal throne inside the throne room opposite the entrance to the palace. Keep going. And when the king saw Queen Esther standing in the court, she won favor in his sight, and he held out to Esther the golden scepter that was in his hand. So... Her life is spared. And she enters in here, sorry to interrupt, on her reputation as queen. We have to remember that. And just like Mordecai, uh, these faithful Jews who are behind the scenes didn't get there because of the you know, political manipulation. They're there because of their consistency. And already we saw that Mordecai demonstrated loyalty to the king. So all of these things are factors that kind of build, right? So keep reading. Verse 3. And the king said to her, What is it, Queen Esther? What is your request? It shall be given it shall be given you even to the half of my kingdom even to the half of my kingdom. And Esther said, If it please if it please the king, let the king and um, Haman come today to a feast that I have prepared for the king. Then the king said, Bring Haman quickly so that we may do as Esther has asked. So the king and Haman came to the feast that Esther had prepared. And as they were drinking wine after the feast, the king said to Esther, What is your wish? It shall be granted you. And what is your request? Even to half of my kingdom it shall be fulfilled. Then Esther answered, My wish and my request, if I have found favor in the sight of the king, and if it please the king to grant my wish and fulfill my request, let the king and Haman come to the feast that I will prepare for them. And tomorrow I will do as the king has said. Okay, so, you know, Here comes this banquet. This is the one that now Esther is going to oversee. She's invited the king and Haman. <clears throat> and we're going to see that uh, this is interesting because it's uh, kind of a, a precipitating event. This is going to uh, unpack in the, uh, some of the narrative that, that comes later. We really are allowed to see Haman for who he really is. Uh, we see in verse 9, uh, we see a little bit of uh, his deep hatred for Mordecai or really anyone who would stand against him in verse 9. Haman went out that day glad and pleased of heart. There's some irony here. We'll start to see irony. But when Haman saw Mordecai in the king's gate, and the, that he did not stand up or tremble or fear before him, Haman was filled with anger against Mordecai. So his deep hatred for Mordecai. And then we see, interestingly, I call it... Uh, Big man, little man syndrome for Haman. I don't know how tall he was, but um, we see it in verse 10 and 11 and 12. Haman controlled himself, however, went into his house and sent for his friends and his wife, Zeresh. Then Haman recounted to them glory, the glory of his riches and the number of his sons and every instance where the king had magnified him and how he had been promoted above all the princes and servants of the king. Do you know people like this? You work with people like... Uh, They're self-promoters. Hard to be in ministry with, aren't they? Self-promoters. Um, there's a principle here that would, you know, I'll talk about in just a second. But verse 12, Haman said, Even Esther, the queen, let, me, let no one but me come with the king to the banquet which she had prepared. And tomorrow also I am invited by her with the king. You see just that uh, me, 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 selfish me. Uh, attitude coming through here, right? So Haman, uh, who's prone to overreact to people and situations, we see that in verse 14. Then Zeresh, his wife, and all of his friends said to him, Have a gallows, 50 cubits high, made, and in the morning ask the king to have Mordecai hanged on it. Then go joyfully with the king to the banquet. And, he had, and, and the advice pleased Haman, so the gallows were made. Wondering, you know, are they just joking there? But he, uh, I think he's overreacting a bit. 
so we start to see now in the account because of this this account, irony starts to show up all over the uh, the, the circumstances here. <clears throat> Sometimes biblical authors will um, accentuate the irony to show and reveal sinful behavior in others, and sometimes also to magnify the fact that God himself is working behind the scenes to kind of steer things and to work through situations, it seems to be the case. So uh, I think that's what we have going on here in chapter 6, verse 1. Um, I look for, in the book of Esther, I don't know if I'm wrong, you might disagree with me, but even here at this point in this verse, I think I see the hand of the Lord at work through a bad night of sleep, mm -hmm. right? It might be, although it's not mentioned. But I think I think I see the Lord kind of working throughout this whole account. Chapter 6, verse 1. During that night, the king could not sleep. Sleepless nights sometimes can be from the hand of the Lord. So he gave an order to bring the book of records, the chronicles, and they were read before the king. So... Uh, what we see here is a, a scene that's set for Mordecai, Mordecai now, to have the same kind of impact that I think Daniel had um, in terms of uh, the, Daniel, that, the, the effect that Daniel had on, on, the, uh, on, on King Darius. Um, his reputation for loyalty is discovered in the royal records, and we see that in verse 2 and 3. So it was found, written... What Mordecai had reported concerning Bigthana and Teresh, two of the king's eunuchs who were doorkeepers, uh, that they had sought to lay hands on King Xerxes or Ahasuerus. And the king said, What honor or dignity has been bestowed on Mordecai for this? Then the king's servants who attended him said, Well, nothing has been done for him. So, uh, verse 4, the king said, Who is... In the court, now Haman had just entered the outer court of the king's palace in order to speak to the king about hanging Mordecai on the gallows, which he had reported for, which he had prepared for him. This is what it looks like. You see the sometimes irony is set up in this kind of uh, uh, you know this kind of historical narrative that's so tightly written and and told. You see the intersection of of uh, plots, you know, you know this marks the bullseye. You know, kind of pressures you in. You read, and it's like, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? Oh, there we go. You start to see it. Then after that, you start to see the whole thing resolve. So that's what we see here. Let's uh, um, verse four. We saw that. Um, you know, the irony here is just as the king here is working out the details. For how am I going to honor Mordecai? The foil to that, or that's the foil to the idea that Haman has already contrived. How am I going to uh, figure out a way to uh, put this guy on the on the gallows? So you see that that's creating, and you know we recall this. Uh, you know Mordecai's words to Esther for such a time as this. That was Esther's time to to act. act. Oh, thank you. This is Mordecai's. For such, for such a time as this, even though the for such a time as this is not in the text. This is, uh, this is Mordecai's for such a time as this. Um, we see Mordecai strategically placed, just like Esther was, as one who deserves honor from the king at just the perfect time. So now we have Esther. She was honored by the king for faithfulness and fidelity. Now we have Mordecai because of his faithfulness and fidelity. The king is responding favorably to Mordecai. So getting back to how, huh, what is it like working with those self-promoters? How do we navigate through in ministry situations? Or maybe work situations, those kinds of, is it, is it, I mean, how do we respond? Uh, does this tell us anything? We can walk away with the timeless principle. Anyone? Anybody with life experience out there working in the real world workplace? What's it like out there? Kind of brutal? Can it be rough? Let them have all the slack they want and run out and hang themselves. <laughs> <laughs> Let them hang themselves. Self-promoters can sometimes hang themselves. 
Sometimes that can work. One of the timeless principles, I'll just throw this out, let me know what y'all think. It's, it's always right to err on the side of what Mordecai maybe is demonstrating here. Let your loyalty and faithfulness speak for you. How's that? Do you want to combat the self-promoter with getting into the game of promoting yourself somehow? Is it? Sometimes that gets us in trouble and we end up paying on ourselves, right? Yeah. Try to err on the side. Maybe it's a principle to err on the side of not promoting yourself but allowing your own hard work, faithfulness, and fidelity to speak speak for itself. You can't err on that side. I think that's, I mean, you may still get caught in crossfire and political situations and all of that, but I think that's the most honoring, th the, the most God-honoring thing that we can do. So the irony continues in verses 6 through 9. Haman came in and the king said to him, what is to be done for the man whom the king desires to honor? <laughs> the irony is just screaming off the page, you know. You think if you've ever read this story so closely, it's just it's just kind of almost humorous. I think it is. Haman thinks it's him. Oh, the king's talking about me. Oh, wonderful. I'm so great. And Haman said to himself, Whom the king desired to honor more than me? Then Haman said to the king, For the man whom the king desires to honor, well, let me tell you, let him bring out a royal robe and uh, which the king has worn and the horse on which the king has ridden, and on whose head a royal crown has been placed, and let the robe and the horse be handed over to the one of the king's most noble princes, and let them array the man whom the king desires to honor, and lead him on horseback through the city square, and proclaim before him, thus it shall be done to the man who the king desires to honor. It's almost like, uh, reminds me of the uh, self-serving uh, uh, little country priest in uh, Pride and Prejudice, what's his name? Uh, oh, yeah, you know what I'm talking about, the really squirrely. Mr. Collins? Yeah, it's Mr. Collins. Yeah. Sorry for those of you who aren't Pride and Prejudice fans. I know, we're talking about a minority of people in the room. But, yeah, there's this uh, kind of this squirrely, kind of greasy character in Pride and Prejudice, this priest who, who's uh, Lady Catherine de Bourgh, remember? You know, he's got his own... You know, really rich person that's funding his whole ministry, and he's just oh, he's always singing her praises. And anyway, yes, these are real situations. We know people like this, and it can be difficult. But Haman is uh, thinking that he's the one whom the king honors. But really, the irony here, we see the crossing of plots here. Haman is setting up to hang himself. So let's move on. I found this picture online. I hope it's uh, not too scary. I don't know the irony of the church steeple in the background, but I was going after the gallows. But the king reveals in verse 10 who he's really talking about. Well, take quickly the robes and the horse, as you have said, and do so for Mordecai, the Jew, who is sitting at the king's gate. Do not fall short in anything of all that you have said. Well, this is going to leave. It's interesting that here we have a reference to Mordecai, the Jew. He's not just any old person. He's a Jew. What does that mean? Here I think that we have another reference to, as we'll see, keep your, uh, keep your uh, post-it note there as we move ahead to uh, the rest and the response of the peanut gallery back home as Mordecai licks his wounds after finding that it's not about him, it's about Mordecai. What does he do and how does he respond? He returns, um, he hurries home mourning. Verse 12, uh, with his head covered. And Haman, which is what you do when you're in shame, cover your head. We will see that his head will be covered again pretty soon. <laughs> There's some irony there, too. Yeah. Double head covering. Um, Haman recounted to Zeresh, his wife, who's the real theologian in the family, and all of his friends, everything that had happened to him, then, his wife, then the wise men and Zeresh, his wife, said to him, If Mordecai, before whom you have begun to fall, is of Jewish origin, you'll not overcome him. How's that? How about the name and the reputation of the God of the Jews, right? Uh, I think there's a subtle hint there 
in that text. You'll not overcome him, but you'll surely fall before him. Where? Why would they say that? Where would they have learned anything about the name and reputation of the God of the Jews? What do you think? You're all silent today. Do you remember what's happened before this time in history in Babylonian and then Persian territory, right? Remind, let's remind ourselves back in, uh, I'm sorry, move ahead to Daniel. Let's turn to Daniel chapter 6. Just remind ourselves of this. I referred to it earlier. But like Mordecai and uh, like Esther, um, we see a lot of these lion's den episodes. And after the lion's den occurred, we see how and what kind of impact it made on Darius in verse 25. Remember that? Darius uh, the king wrote to all the peoples, nations, and men of every language who were living in the land. May your peace abound. I make a decree that in all of my dominion of my kingdom, men are to fear and tremble before the God of Daniel. Now, we don't know exactly, I mean, but there seems to be an echo reverberating around Persia about the God of the Jews. This is the God who got Daniel through that, well, in every other case, death situation. He came out and the king was changed because of it, you know, in this decree. He is a living God. He's enduring forever. This is theologically correct. And his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed and his dominion will not be, will be forever. He, he delivers and rescues and there we go, performs signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. Who's also delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. I just wonder if this kind of... Uh, Correct theology is still kind of bouncing around to Persia, you know, to uh, have it come through the uh, to the mouths at this particular time of Mordecai. I'm sorry, of uh, Haman's wife and his advisors here. So that might be behind what's going on. So the next day, Esther hosts her banquet for King, for the King and for Haman. She takes her opportunity. Again, she's still taking a risk here to reveal both her identity as a Jew. And she's going to reveal Haman's plot to kill the Jews in verses um, chapter 7, verse 3 through 6. Let's have uh, Lauren back there. Could you read for us in chapter 7, verse 3 through 6? Okay. Queen Esther answered, If I have obtained your approval, my king, and if the king of kings, spare my life. This is my request, and spare my people. This is my desire. For my people and I have been sold out to destruction, death, and extermination. If we had merely been sold as male and female slaves, I would have kept silent. Indeed, the trouble wouldn't be worth burdening the king. King Asperius spoke up and asked Queen Esther, Who is this, and where is the one who would devise such a scheme? Esther answered, The adversary and enemy is the evil, Haman. Haman stood terrified before the king and queen. All right, so now we've got this rapid unraveling of, of the plot here. Um, so we see him begging the queen. Um, he sticks around in verse 7. He starts to beg for his life from Queen Esther. Uh, verse 8 is interesting. Uh, now when the king returned from the palace garden into the place where they had been drinking wine, Haman was falling on the couch where Esther was. Then the king said, Will he even assault the queen with me, with me in the house? He's looking at the situation. It seems as if he's recognizing that or potentially seeing that Haman is now even threatening his own wife uh, in verse 8. So uh, here's the irony. We saw it earlier when he leaves the scene, when he um, over here uh, in terms of his head covering, covering his head in verse 12 back in chapter 6. Now we have the follow-up to that in, uh, in verse 8. As the word went out of the king's mouth, they covered Haman's face. So now he's for a different reason, of course. I think the uh, idea there is when you, you cover someone's face, who's the person whose face is covered has been disgraced or is humiliated in shame. And it's interesting that later in history, I, I haven't done a full historical research project on this, but of course anybody goes 
who goes to the gallows, right, typically will have their, their head covered. So that idea of the person going here has been humiliated in shame. And uh, we see that in verse uh, 9 and 10. The irony of ironies, the highlight of the irony is happens um, in verses 9 and 10. Then Harbona, one of the eunuchs who were before the king, said, Behold, indeed, he wasn't even going that direction until this was mentioned. The gallows, standing at Haman's house, 50 cubits high, which Haman made for Mordecai, who spoke good on behalf of the king. And the king said, Hang him on it. So they hanged Haman on the gallows, which had been prepared for Mordecai, and the king's anger um, subsided. So the ultimate irony of ironies. Well, we're not completely done. There's still some interesting things in uh, in the book of uh, Esther. Let's uh, let's take a break here. We'll come back and finish Esther after. Come back uh, in about six minutes. All right. Started.